Thank you, Brother Jackson, for your beautiful singing this morning. Uh, I really liked the first song, the chorus. It was very, very nice. And yeah, I can see you are a linguist. You speak a lot of languages. And uh, thanks, Brother Alan, for your, for your beautiful Lord's Supper sermon. And thanks everyone we have said this morning. So uh, today I'm talking on a topic staying with sound doctrine coming from Titus 2. So when uh, Brother Ryan asked me for a scripture reading last night, I said uh, it's Titus chapter 2, verse 1 to 15. I didn't want to scare him to say the whole chapter, brother. <laughs> I said 1 to 15, but it's actually the whole, the whole chapter. <laughs> but he figured it out that it's actually the whole chapter, so maybe it didn't work. So uh, I was just looking through the internet and I searched to just find out what is the most Googled question on the internet. So if you look on the internet, you'll see that uh, the most Googled question is not what caught my attention. It caught my attention a bit. It's where people are asking what is my IP or IP address. Brother Alan will know or what, what that means. It basically means when you are connected to your internet, it can locate where you are and it tells you, your, based on where your location and how you are interacting on the internet, it tells you you are situated uh, in Cape Town, in this uh, in Mowbray or wherever you are. But another question that came with, uh, I think, on a, on a monthly basis, on average, it, it is uh, asked 1.8 million times. So the, the, the top one, which I just mentioned, uh, is 3.5 million times, that is asked in a month. Another question that caught my attention is, where am I? People ask, where am I? 1.8 million times. So, as people don't know where they are, why are they asking that question? So, I just thought, like, we have been through almost 300, uh, 365 divided by two, half of, half of the year we've been through. We are going through the topic uh, for this year, maturing in Christ. And we have covered many topics, but where are we now? Are you also not asking, where am I? If I come to you and speak about uh, sound doctrine, how does it relate with the entire theme that we have been going through? So as I cover through my, as I go through my lesson, this is my lesson plan, I'm going to uh, speak on where are we in terms of the theme of the year, and uh, also with that I will cover what is sound doctrine. Then from there I will go through uh, sound doctrine according to Titus 2 and uh, what are the key takeaways for me from that uh, chapter that Brother Ryan read for us. And how lack of governance can lead us back to bondage. Knowing that we have freedom as we are, how can lack of good governance lead us back to bondage? Reasons why sound doctrine is abandoned. So I will look at three reasons why the sound doctrine or how the sound doctrine uh, is abandoned. And uh, with that I will then look at how can the church safeguard the doctrine from manipulation or from being abandoned. Then I will conclude by what is our duty in terms of safeguarding the sound doctrine. Now, so where are we? Can anyone tell me any one theme of the month that we covered so far? Any one theme for any one month? <laughs> Brother Alan? Righteous believer. Righteous believer? Courageous believer? Yes, last month. Anyone else? Okay, anyway, so it's necessary that I'm going through this, because it seems we don't remember. Yeah, uh, I think uh, 
I also don't remember what I ate last night for summer, so <laughs> I know it's possible for people to forget. So anyway, so in, in January we looked at knowing Christ. Then we went on to look at uh, understanding the word. Then we looked at waiting for the Lord. Then we looked at being Christ-like. Then courageous believer. Now we are in good governance and wisdom. But how does sound doctrine link to all of these? The first thing, you agree with me, the first thing that needs to happen to you is to know Christ. How can you come to him without knowing who he is? Without hearing about him? We knew him as a creator, as a humble servant who washed his feet, or as a humble king who washed uh, his disciples' feet, and the one who is uh, ways who judge us. Those are some of the topics that we looked at. And that is now building up to the doctrine that we should be following. The doctrine of being humble. The doctrine that teaches us that Jesus Christ is the creator. The doctrine that teaches us that he is the bread of life. That is the doctrine that we were introducing. And at that time, we were crawling like babies, just trying to understand the first part. Now we went on to build on that. And we started chewing bone and eating marrow. When we were now trying to understand the word, yes, we know, but now we want to understand what the word means. We want to be able to expand it, to be able to actually understand and interpret the scriptures. We went and looked at the hard sayings of Christ. We went and looked at how the word is the lamp onto our feet. And after that, after we understood the word, we then went on into understanding why is it important to wait for the Lord? And that we should stop being anxious. That's, that's the doctrine that we are teaching. That we should stop being anxious. But with prayer and supplication, submit our request to God. And we understood when will God answer my prayer so that in the waiting period you don't become overly anxious. Ask him when is God going to answer my prayer. Now that we learned about waiting in the Lord, that prepared us to be Christ-like. To live on every word, because we understand the word. To speak the truth only, and to have the mindset of Christ. And to be able to say, I am here to do God's will. Now when we were Christ-like, we are now imitators of Christ. Just like Paul was an imitator of Christ. We knew that we have been adopted to become the sons and daughters of God. And that gave us the rightful, uh, well, that made us the rightful heirs to the kingdom. Heirs of the kingdom of heaven. And that made us courageous believers. And with that we arose and we took what God had given us. Because we are now courageous. And we are able to stand against the winds of life. Because we knew who is backing us. And we were able to keep moving. Because he enabled us to be able to move. We then surrendered the battle. Because we knew the battle is not ours. But the battle is for the Lord. Then we became victorious and we overcome. Now we have overcome. We have now this kingdom that we have. That we have taken. What do we do with it? Somebody needs to govern it. It needs to be governed. If it's not governed properly, you will regret and think that it was better that I wasn't taken out of Egypt. Like what the Israelites were doing. Every time they would regret and say, oh no, why did you take us from, the, uh, from Egypt? We were much better off there. But with good governance, God would arise good judges with good governance to come 
and rescue his people. And without good governance, they will be taken out of a bondage or protected from going into bondage because of the good governance and wisdom. Brother Mark spoke on fear, fear the Lord, and he covered a lot on uh, what good governance is, comparing good and bad governance. He spoke about corruption, he spoke about what the modern day governance, government, governments do, which we see as bad, which is bad. And he also spoke on what is good governance and how we can use it, uh, whether in the world or within the church. Now, staying with the sound doctrine, what is the sound doctrine? So if you go to the book of Titus, chapter 2, when you are going to read this follows uh, way Brother Ryan read for us. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Verse number two, temperate, worth of respect, self-controlled, sound, sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Be reverent, verse number five, to be self-controlled. Now it's now the elderly teaching the young. So, my key takeaway from there is that it speaks first about the older, what they need to do and the qualities they need to have. And those ones, they now need to teach the younger to have certain qualities and characteristics. Now, one thing that we need to really understand here is, as we mature in Christ, we started in January by just knowing Christ. And I said we were babies, crawling, uh, crawling toddlers, feeding only on meal. Life cycle I'm talking about is not the physical life cycle, the physical aging. Because you might be at an age, physical appearance, you are a young adult, but your spiritual life cycle, you are still a baby. Or you are a young adult by physical look, but spiritual mindset in terms of understanding Christ, you now have the wisdom. You are at a full grown adult with full, full of wisdom and be able to govern. On when is the Bible start? Does anyone remember at what age Josiah, Josiah became, became king? Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. So he was a toddler. But his mindset, God saw something in Josiah. At that age, at eight years of, age, age of old, he could become a king. He was a king. So it's not about the physical appearance I'm talking about here. I'm talking about how you mature as a Christian. The Christianity in you, how it matures. Is it maturing? to the age of being now having wisdom to be able to govern? Or is it still a toddler mindset that you still have as a Christian? Ephesians 4 verse number 11. So Christ gave the apostles, the apostles, the evangelists, or the, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up while we all reach unity in faith and in, in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Attend, all, attend to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of doctrine and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. So, Learning the word of God will help you to solidify your knowledge in Christ. Once you solidify that, you will not be easily blown away because people will come with different views of different uh, ways, but you must be able to stand against those. But if you are not really sure of what you stand for, then you will be easily blown. So, Teachers who are there, they are there to equip us 
so that we can become mature. And as uh, the scripture says in Titus 2, then we can be sound in faith and in endurance, so we can endure. Even if it's pain, we can endure it. And also we'll be able to teach what is good. By some doctrine, we will know that we are children of God. As such, we are heirs to the promise, and that we can surrender the battle to Him. That's how we win. In other ways, we are free. However, some doctrine has been fought in this perspective. Where we are taught otherwise, that the men of that that men of God have different powers. That is doctrine that is being taught around the world. It distances itself even though they they come in wearing the uh, covering of sheep. They say that so you hear people saying that ah there is this man of God who lives there, he is more powerful. And you hear there is another man of God living there and there who is even more powerful than that one. But where are they getting that power? Is they, are they not getting the power from the same God? Now, how does this man have more power than this? Does the Bible not teach us that we are just but the vessels? The power that works within us is the power from God. Does it differ that you, this, there is this man of God or this other man of God, or the God is still the same? Why do we see that distinction between the man of God? who claim to have more power than others. And that doctrine is pushing us away from how we understand God as. And it's taking away freedom from us, the freedom in Christ that we have, according to Galatians chapter 5, verse number 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourself be beaten again by yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. So, now, there are certain traditions. So, in this regard, Apostle Paul is talking about the tradition of circumcision, where some people were forcing Gentiles to be circumcised to say, that's how you can come close to God. That's how God will hear your prayers. But Paul is saying, that is not the sound doctrine that you are supposed to be uh, preaching. Those people who are preaching about that, this, that is a law, not a doctrine of Christ. It's a tradition which needs to be abandoned. So, circumcision was a tradition followed by Jews. It has a biblical origination, was part of the law or ceremonial laws. But those things, those people now were saying, okay, because you are not a Gentile, you don't qualify because of A, B, C, D. So you are not supposed to come close to God. So it was used to disqualify others from coming to God because they are not Jews. Are we not burdened by certain things today? Are they not traditional myths and beliefs that we have. Are there no cultural ceremonies or ceremonial laws of our culture that we follow and we don't even know why we follow them? Like in the Shona culture, I don't know about other uh, African cultures if they have that way. You, you have a ceremony, uh, so let's say you your, 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 the, the, the father is born, or the, yeah, the father is born, then we have a ceremony to actually take a bull, pour water on it, and name it after the father. A bull like a cow, uh, like from, from the crop. And now that bull should be respected. You shouldn't beat it, you shouldn't use it for pulling uh, the the, the, the old John plows shouldn't use it for anything else. Now it's the father. But it's still sleeping in the crow. 
Now, you think about all those things. What sort of protection is that bull going to give you? If things come, they will steal it. They will take and go with it. Doesn't any have any value, but people follow those cultural beliefs and burden themselves to follow those beliefs, not knowing why they are following those beliefs. You see, people go to churches where you get those bangles, necklaces, chains everywhere, and anointing water, anointing oil. And the problem with that is. You have to now carry it around everywhere you go because that's where you feel that's where your protection is. Now if you, you, you are going, let's say you are going for an interview, you forget that anointing water. You feel naked. And you can't go anywhere, you have to go back. Now, what kind of a God needs to be carried around? Now you slowly depart from the sound doctrine where we know by knowing Christ we know that God is omnipresent he's everywhere but you depart from that and you now go around carrying that little thing that you have been given thinking that's where your protection is now Paul is saying here mark my words I Paul tell you that if you let those things that you do those cultural beliefs those bangles if you let yourself get those things, Christ will be of no value to you. Because now you are going to an interview. You are looking for the bangles, you are looking for the anointing water. Christ is of no value to you. Again, again I declare to every man who lets himself carry those things that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Now you can't say, I only can, can, uh, need the anointing water, but when they talk about sitting, I don't want to do. They will, they, they, will, they will trap you. They will make sure that you buy that anointing water. You have to pay for one-on-one -on -one with pastors. You have to pay like for consulting. Some charges are even more than doctors consulting. <laughs> now, you, you, because you can't just say, I will choose this, but not the other. They will make sure that you are trapped. Could you read Galatians chapter 5, verse number 4? You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Verse number seven. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? Brother Alan spoke about Demas. He was running a good race. Who cut in on him to go back to Thessalonica? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Tolerating those little thinkings. Those, you think about certain things, but if you tolerate it for longer, you end up believing in those things. You start by a little thing, by just watching a video and tolerating it of those preachings until you start believing in those preachings. So a little yeast works through the whole door. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, or if I'm still preaching about those things, about having mentors, about having those bangles, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. Now we have this freedom. Let us not abuse it. In verse number 13, you, my brothers and sisters, you were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. That's what we are supposed to use our freedom in. Like Brother Max spoke about how uh, modern governments are corrupt. They do things for personal gains because they, they feel like they are above the law. We are not supposed to feel like we are above the law. We are supposed to use our freedom to help others, to see how we can uh, save others. Reasons why some doctrine is abandoned. Number one is 
false teachers and the love of money. Congregants pay switch to suit their own desires. Number three is power paste and due to feeling pressure from congregants. False teachers and the love of money. If you go to two, uh, to to First Timothy chapter six, from verse two b to verse uh, sixteen, I will not read all of it, but you will see there that it says that there are some teachers who have a corrupt mind, who thinks that the Bible is a means to financial gain, who thinks that preaching the word of God is a means to financial gain, so that they will create one on ones, they will, they, they will make themselves look as if they are very powerful and claim to be powerful than others so that you will have a need to see them and they use that for financial benefit they will charge you to see them they will make you pay tithe which will go into their pockets so if you go there you will see uh, number five verse five here uh, first Timothy chapter six verse number five it says in constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Second reason why uh, those things are why people depart from the sound doctrine, congregants pursue to seek their own desires. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1, he says, For the time will come. Uh, I'm reading from verse number three. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. So they don't look for the people who preach the truth, but they will gather preachers who will speak what they want to hear. So they, in other ways, they will tell the preachers what to speak. If they want to hear about prosperity, they will gather preachers who will speak about prosperity. Is it not what is happening now? We, we know on, 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 online there are pastors who speak about prosperity, there are pastors who speak about this. So when you feel like you want to hear about prosperity, just scroll on YouTube. You even know their names. You select, you hear about prosperity. You don't go to church anymore because if you go to church now you are bound to listen to whatever is according to the doctrine of the church. But now you scroll and listen on sermons on, on YouTube because you want to hear what you want to hear, not what God has prepared for you to hear on that day. Preachers feeling pressure from congregants. A good example comes from the from Old Testament. When uh, the people were thirsty and didn't have water, the alleged of didn't have water, they were coming from... Uh, from Egypt on their way to, 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 to Canaan. Now, the Lord said to Moses, take the staff and you and your brother Aaron gather the assemb assembly together, speak to, to that rock before their eyes and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so, so they and their livestock can drink. But he, li listen carefully here. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. Now let's see what Moses then went on to do. Because now he is uh, in front of this whole multitude. He is under pressure. The people want water. They are putting pressure on him. Then he said, then, then this is what Moses did. Verse number 11. Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out in the community and their lives of drink. And for that reason, Moses was punished dearly. But Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because he did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community in the, into the land I give them. That's why Moses could not make it to Canaan. So, you wanted, so we, we have those, uh, those congregants who put pressure on the preachers. And the preachers will be under pressure to also respond. Because people think that if you pray for them, they need to fall. To just make sure that their demons are gone. Or they need to see demons manifesting. Now, they will go and hire people to come and fall in church. So that people will think this pastor is very powerful. 
if, you, if, you, if they pray for you and if, if, you, if you also go there, you don't know the deal. They are praying for you, you are not falling, they will trip you and you fall. <laughs> so, it can be because of the pressure from the congregants. Because the congregants are looking for a powerful person. Now, you have to look powerful, you have to, to, to improvise, to do things that you are not supposed to do. But how can the church save God from that happening? Now, Titus 1 verse number 5, you will see that uh, now Paul is saying, the reason I left you in Crete, talking to Titus, was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed. Now he's speaking about uh, elders in verse number 9. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. So now, instead of having a one-man show like in those other congregations, in other, other churches where they say uh, this church belongs to A, B, C, and D. Now, yeah, God is saying that you need to have elders in church or leadership in church so that they can save God from that happening. It's no longer a one-man show because if others want to bring in things that are not allowed by the doctrine, then the, the leadership can actually intervene and say, where are we getting this? Where in the Bible are you taking this? If here I am to introduce, uh, if I say uh, I, I, I like I'm a piano, so I'm going to bring my piano here, the leadership will tell me, no, you can't do that. It's not according to the sound doctrine. But if it was my church, I would do whatever I need. So having that structure of leadership will help and safeguard. And those who are placed in leadership, need to know that they need to refute and oppose those who suggest things which are not according to the doctrine. In conclusion, brethren, we all have a part to play in safeguarding the doctrine and staying in the sound doctrine. For you to be able to lead others, you need to start by leading yourself. You can't lead others if you can't lead yourself. In everything, Set them an example by doing what is good. Titus 2, verse number 7. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. And it goes on to say what we should be teaching. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they, are, they can be fully trusted, so that in every way we we'll make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. These are the things you should teach, encourage, and rebuke with authority. Do not let anyone despise you. So as we as we go out, let us just remember that it is our responsibility to stay in the sound doctrine and also to see how we can encourage others to stay in the sound doctrine. May the Lord bless the reading of his scripture. Thank you. Lord, give me unto her.